Welcome to this evening's episode of Mysteries, Graveyards, and the Human Psyche. Today we're going to be exploring the winter solstice and we're going to be exploring it in a very unorthodox way because we're bringing a little bit of Halloween into the winter solstice with pumpkins and there's nothing really wrong about that is there <laughs> so I would like to welcome families uh, children anybody who is um, gonna listen tonight to take the message of the book to heart and just uh, be creative Without further ado, I would like to start the episode. So thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy this evening's episode. This is a show about authentic deep connection to the in-between spaces. Join me and my guests as we explore the boundaries between heaven and earth, between the living and the dead, between night and day. Welcome to Mysteries, Graveyards, and the Human Psyche. I'm your host, Melissa B. On this week's episode... So I just find the Wheel of the Year to be um, very beautiful because you can enter it at any point. And if you, so just to speak, kind of fall off the wheel and fall out of an awareness of your intrinsic connection to the earth, you can just get back on. The special thing about artists is that when we explore our own work and our reaction to life itself in an individual level and on a societal level, we wind up inadvertently helping other people as well. And that's just the case with today's episode which is a beautiful reading of a children's book called A Pumpkin for Solstice, written by my friend Megan Callahan. Megan Callahan is a Renaissance woman. And it's interesting because this book was in part inspired by William Shakespeare. Megan is a musician, a poet, an actress. She teaches in the style of Michael Chekhov. She is a yoga practitioner, a massage therapist, an energy worker, a Reiki master. She offers beautiful earth healing, and she's also a businesswoman. She started her own yoga studio, and she is going to be reading her book for us tonight. But before she gets started, Megan, will you please tell us what the winter solstice is, because I think for most people, it's just a curious date on December 21st on their calendar. But what does the winter solstice actually mean for human beings the world over? The winter solstice is one of the eight holy days that are recognized in the wheel of the year that for those of us in the Northern hemisphere, as we are recognizing that we are also journeying through the seasons, that this is one of the stops along the way. And one of the moments, a sacred day where we pause and honor that we are on this journey along with every other being on earth. And so the winter solstice, there are two solstices, there's the winter solstice and the summer solstice, and both of them are these tipping points. So if we think of the equinoxes as these brief, beautiful moments where there is a balance of light and dark on the planet, the solstices are these tipping points for a deeper reset that's happening. Uh, so the winter solstice is the longest night of the year in the Northern hemisphere, and the summer solstice is the longest day of the year. So we're journeying into that uh, collective experience as beings, not just humans, but all of the beings acknowledging that we are on this shared journey with the seasons changing within and around us. So the winter solstice in Celtic tradition is considered um, the birth of the sun, this beautiful time where we acknowledge the return of the light. And in our culture, 
it is the first day of winter. Um, and the first day of winter is also signaling that winter is connected to the growing season. Like this has been a huge part of the healing for me as I used to think of these things much more separate, much more compartmentalized as opposed to a woven whole. So the winter solstice is actually for me, this signifier that spring is coming, that things are germinating under the ground, that that process is beginning within us. So we're honoring um, the dark, we're honoring germination and trusting this deep trust that the cycle will keep going and that we have made it that the cycle will keep going and that we have made it every culture for thousands of years has had different festivals honoring light you know and we are much more acquainted with ones in our modern culture like the christmas holiday and hanukkah um, Diwali, now Kwanzaa, that these holidays are again nestled within the Northern Hemisphere around this time of the year as we uh, approach the end of the Gregorian calendar. So I just find the wheel of the year to be um, very beautiful because you can enter it at any point. And if you, so to speak, kind of fall off the wheel and fall out of an awareness of your intrinsic connection to the earth, you can just get back on because it's a sense that it's ever going and it's this spiral that we all share together. So without further ado, Megan will read us her book, Pumpkin for Solstice. And grown-ups, please stay tuned after the reading to find out more about how this book came to be. A pumpkin for solstice? A pumpkin for solstice? A story for kids and grown-ups about doing things differently right now. This is a different year. A weird year. It's a bit sad, too. I miss my family and friends a whole lot. We can't see folks right now we love to see or travel or do some of the really fun things we do at the holidays and when the seasons change. Tonight we read a book with my mom at dinner about this guy from a really long time ago named William Shakespeare. One part of the book talked about this thing called a plague that mom said is sort of like this virus, but we use a different word now, pandemic. Shakespeare, which is what grown-ups call him for short, couldn't do what he liked to do or see folks he loved either during the plague in 1592. What a long time ago. He was an actor and also wrote plays. For two years, he couldn't be on the stage. No one could. So he wrote lots of plays and poems. People even wore masks then too. They covered your whole face and had beaks. People look like weird birds. This got me thinking, hmm, Shakespeare couldn't do some of what he wanted to do, so he did other things. And it didn't last forever. The theaters reopened and the plays came back. Maybe I could do that too? Be creative? We still have a pumpkin from a different, weird, and kind of sad Halloween. All the other pumpkins around have rotted, but somehow not this one. So I asked mom if we could carve it for the winter solstice. The winter solstice is one of my favorite holidays all year. It's the longest night of the year, which means we get to stay up late. And it also means longer days are coming back, that we are slowly on our way to the longest day of the year, which is the opposite, the summer solstice. We make lanterns and bird feeders. Then we light candles and send blessings or wishes full of love to our families, friends, neighbors, and all the creatures of the whole world. And this year we have a solstice pumpkin too. Because sometimes these plagues and pandemics happen. When they do, we have to do things a little differently to keep people safe. It also means we can get creative. 
And remember that just like for Shakespeare, it won't always be this way. So I'm going to ask my mom if we can show our family the solstice pumpkin on Zoom. And maybe I'll write a poem about it like that Shakespeare guy. And then even though it's different, weird, and a little sad, this time can also be more than a little special. Solstice pumpkin, orange and bright, we are lighting you on a winter's night. I send love to my family near and far as I look at the candle that's just like a star. And I try to remember we'll soon be together because even sad times, they don't last forever. Solstice pumpkin, orange and bright, we are lighting you on a winter's night. Happy Solstice! The end. What can you do to be creative? Would you make something with your family? Would you write a poem? Would you create a toy or a game or a song? Whatever you do, as long as you do it from your heart, it's just perfect. And now we'll get back to our conversation with author Megan Callahan. So I went to my very first winter solstice celebration 13 years ago in Burlington, Vermont, and it was a kirtan. And it was a kirtan that was an all night kirtan. And kirtan, for those who are not familiar, is an ancient form of call and response chanting that comes from Vedic culture. And I love it so much because it's a householder's tradition. So whereas we have certain traditions that are relegated to um, priests and um, certain sects of people, kirtan has always been a householder's tradition. So you come together in a circle and people sing songs. So this was a special installment of kirtan for the winter solstice where everybody had a tea light and they lit a candle and said prayers for the world and said, imbued blessings into these candles. And then we all had all of these tea lights plus communal candles. And there were these lights to be with us through the longest night of the year. So this light was accompanying us and we chanted and danced and feasted. And some people stayed up all night until the sun broke through. And I felt for the first time connected to traditions of the ancient ones, of our ancestors and of people who were the first ones to say, oh, I'm noticing some repetition here. I'm noticing these rhythms that we're journeying through. And we notice that the days are getting shorter or the days are getting longer. And it happens about this time of year. And they were the first ones to tell stories and write about that. So I I love the winter solstice because it connects us to the earliest beings all the way back. And it's also a really, even though it has um, um, often associations with pagan and Celtic culture, in our modern culture, it's also become a beautiful way for people who come from different faith traditions um, uh, to be an ecumenical celebration of our shared humanity. Mm. It's so beautiful. <laughs> and I love how you talk about this being a special time for storytelling. And I really wanted to um, share the book that you had written um, during 2020 um, called The Pumpkin for Solstice, because it was an extraordinary year. And we kind of fell out of rhythm uh, with these different cycles. Uh, we weren't really able to have the celebrations or the celebrations that we had been looking forward to. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, the origins of your book or what led you to create something like this? <laughs> mm. Yes, yeah, so it connects to exactly what you just said, Melissa. That was so beautiful because I was so moved by this winter solstice celebration that I shared in, in Burlington that I wanted to bring it back to Buffalo, which is where I live. And I was very involved in some, still am, in some beautiful communities there of music makers and um, 
people who practice yoga and chant kirtan and uh, different practices that nourish the spirit. So I brought this back and the year after uh, Burlington, we had a winter solstice celebration at Buffalo Yoga, which is a studio that no longer exists, though the spirit of it is still very potent. And we started these annual winter solstice celebrations that in the early years, much like the Burlington, especially as I was newer to these mysteries, were uh, an entry point that I could connect with. So Kirtan, lighting tea lights, singing, um, uh, sending out blessings and prayers to the world and, and spending the night together and dancing and celebrating. As the years passed, and then as I became a mother, the, um, these celebrations started to take on a deeper uh, significance for me. So uh, Yoga Parkside, which is the studio that I founded when uh, my older son, who's now eight years old, was just two months old. So we had our very first winter solstice celebration at Parkside Lutheran Church. And there was a kirtan in the sanctuary of the church with all of this candlelight. And then we had um, yoga classes and meditation and crafts and a feast and dancing. And this became, some people would look forward to this all year. And we would do this every year. And so last year would have been our eighth annual winter solstice celebration, but we couldn't have it because of the pandemic. And I toyed with the idea of whether we could, you know, some things, all of us were in this conversation of, can I reclaim this somehow? Can this happen in an online medium? Or does this need to just be on pause? And we had to feel into that. And so the winter solstice celebration so much for me and the others who would share in it was about us being our physical bodies, being together in a space. So it didn't feel like it could happen via Zoom. And I think that uh, like many others, my heart was in a sad space. And I just, uh, I did have a very small winter solstice um, fire in my backyard with just a couple of dear ones on the actual solstice, but I was sad because I felt like I potentially could have done the heavy lifting of making this celebration happen in an alternative way. But when I really talked with spirit, it felt like it would have lost the magic. So, um, and I was in some grief. A lot of us were grieving. There were so many souls that were lost, so many ways of life that were lost. And I, um, this last Christmas was the very first holiday season that I did not spend with my mother and sister since I was born. And I know that's true for other people as well. And there was a lot of grief. You know, my sister had had a baby and, and I just was feeling that this collective grief on the part of everyone. Like I knew what I was experiencing and what my children were experiencing. And then I could hear via what I call the bat signal, <laughs> what others were experiencing. So this kind of came together in the way that creative projects sometimes um, just rise up and fuego, as opposed to something that you plot out and spend time. So I was sitting at the table reading, we often at dinner time will read books. And I was reading this book to my children that was about William Shakespeare. And um, what I found really fascinating is I had just picked up this book intuitively because books talk to me. And as I'm reading this book, I'd never read it before. I'm reading it to them. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is about the plague. <laughs> Like it wasn't just about Shakespeare. It was specifically about Shakespeare in the time of the plague and the effect that the plague had had on him needing to, um, you know, hole up for two years because everything shut down and the globe shut down. And there were these, the masks, the pictures of um, these uh, very interesting masks that people wore during, during the bubonic plague. And in that moment, it hit me and connected me to this thread again of shared humanity. And I had thought about, um, you know, the 1918 epidemic. My great grandmother actually perished in um, the flu epidemic. Mine too. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. 
yeah, she, uh, my great grandmother, my ancestor perished in childbirth with the flu during that pandemic. But I hadn't gone back further than that. Like I hadn't thought about pandemics prior to that. And something about reading that book, I'm getting chills as I talk about this now, Mm -hmm. it just placed us again on this continuum of a shared experience of humanity. Because when we're grieving and we're in our homes alone, we can feel so cut off, not just from one another, but from our place in the mystery and the grand scheme of things. So I'm reading this book and I just was really touched and struck by it. And I'm talking to the kids about Shakespeare. And later that night, my uh, fiance was upstairs and he actually wasn't my fiance. He proposed on Christmas morning. So a few days before all of this, uh, he was doing Tai Chi in the attic. And I was sitting in this little space we have called the Calm Down Corner, which is a space like Tich Nhat Hanh talks about to just sit and practice smiling. So I was just sitting in this space, taking care of my grief because I was feeling gratitude to be with my beloved, but so sad that the following week I wasn't going to have this celebration or to be with my loved ones. And so I started writing on my phone, this little poem. And it's probably still on my phone (laughs) and it all came out. Sometimes, you know, I'm a songwriter and a writer and a maker and a creative being like you are, Melissa. And as you know, the creativity comes about in such different ways. Sometimes something just comes all the way through fully formed. And other times it's a slower labor. So this was a quick labor. This came right through very powerfully. And immediately afterwards, I felt the need to share it. So I texted it to a couple of friends who were real Shakespeare fans to just say, hey, this thing just came through and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about it. And feedback came through of, Megan, this is really powerful. (laughs) So that same night, I um, messaged a couple of dear ones and within 48 hours, this poem I wrote which, uh, because the solstice was a few days away and I wanted, I felt there was a certain urgency, like this had been birthed quickly. And I felt like this needed to get to people so they could collectively process that things were different this year and that we can still find magic even amidst that. So a friend of mine said, sure, I can do that. I, I, I think I put the call out on Instagram. And people wrote back to me like, yes, because everyone else was home too. Everyone else was also having their own grief and their own experience. And now they had an invitation to move that energy and be creative. So my friend um, Joy did these beautiful illustrations and she first like mapped out, like sketched them. And then she realized that she wasn't gonna have enough time to do this by hand. So she was gonna find stock art but we wanted to still have something that was done by hand. So my other friend, Ashley, designed a cover of a pumpkin for solstice. And then my other friend, Gayatri, um, did a mandala for the back cover. And then my friend, Tara, helped us with the editing. So this team of people and all feminine um, uh, identifying beings just shoop, came up to help assist this labor. And this all was inspired by the fact that there were pumpkins sitting outside and it was snowing and these pumpkins somehow had not rotted. And that was part of what inspired it. It was the marriage of this story about Shakespeare and the bubonic plague and him needing to shut himself up for two years and the immense creativity that burgeoned forth from that, right? Right. Like you said we have, you said that he wrote most of the plays that we know in that time, right? Most of the hits, most, most of the of famous the plays hits. of Shakespeare, the big hits were written in those two years of him being locked up at home and not able, you know. And so, so what are those gifts that are afforded to us? What, how can we find the gold during difficult times of what can come forth in terms of unexpected connection and creativity? So this pumpkin 
out on the porch and the snow and this Shakespeare book went and had this magic. And I went, oh, a pumpkin for solstice. So now this solstice tradition that had become so special to me of celebrating the winter solstice, you know, I have friends whose children now look forward every year, you know, we um, uh, make these lanterns every year and we sing this lantern song. I go with my little lantern, my lantern is going with me. In heaven the stars are shining, on earth my lantern's with me. So I believe that comes from the Waldorf tradition. So I was taught that song. So every year we make these lanterns and with little electric tea lights and we decorate them. And then we go outside and do a lantern walk and sing that song. And we hang up bird feeders as an offering to the animals. We make, you know, and all of these again are ancient traditions from different cultures in terms of honoring the solstice. So I thought, how can we do this still not together? So that's what really was the inspiration for the book was a sad little kid, which was inside of all of us. We all had sad little kids <laughs> inside of us, even if we're not parents and thinking, oh, okay, things are a little different this year. And there's a sadness about that. And how can we simultaneously collectively honor that sadness and also still honor our shared humanity and still find joy and creativity. And in the midst of that then is this opportunity for remembering that this thing we've been fed, like when we're little and someone says, are you happy or are you sad? And then you have to pick one, <laughs> that you have to pick one of these feelings or one of these experiences, that that's not how it works. We're complex beings and mm -hmm. we have multiple experiences happening within us at the same time. Mm -hmm looking for synthesis and integration mm -hmm. and that creativity is one of the most powerful midwives that we have for processing um, big emotions mm -hmm. and tough times in, um, in our collective history and experience together. So it became just this little children's book that really was a bigger story. And then for me, it was also almost like a holiday card here. So I was sending it out to all kinds of people and putting it up and got all of these messages back about how much it meant and how much it touched them. And I was in a, a Facebook group at the time that was called Parenting During the Pandemic. And it was a way that parents were processing. So many of us who were parents, you know, were trying to work and take care of children who were having a very tough time remote learning cut off from their social networks. So it was unexpectedly taking uh, what I like to do as a mover of energy and a healer and whew, putting it into this transmission that I could offer out. And now we all thought we were going to sure be on the other side of this this year, mm. didn't we? Yeah. And we're not. Yeah. And once again, I'm not going to see my sister for Christmas. And once again, you know, we are actually going to have a winter solstice celebration indoors, hopefully, um, together, but, but it's still a, a, a weird, different holiday than, than it was two years ago for so many of us. And so I found that the book still has relevance, which is how you found out about it because I shared it like, Hey, we're in solstice season. I wrote this last year. If this resonates for anyone's and then I shared it with my kids' teachers, and they're asking me to come in now and read it in the class because I felt like there is a lot of grief tending that needs to happen collectively that we have barely even begun. We are still actively in this pandemic. And so there's grief piling on top of grief. And I've seen that from the beginning. There was a lot going on with all of our hearts before the pandemic arrived. And now we have grief on top of grief. And how are we going to begin to process that? And story is one of the ways that we process that, right? Creativity, enlisting other friends to be part of a creative process with us. Um, for me, ever since a very young age, 
playing piano, writing poetry, writing songs. Those are the ways that I sung my heart back to life from some of its toughest seasons. I am truly honored to interview Megan and all of my other wonderful guests. We have new episodes every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Canadian New York time. Coming up, we have an interview with Glenn Heroy, who has been Santa for 30 years. And we also have a very spooky Christmas night episode that you can listen to with your family as you sit around and drink hot chocolates or hot toddies or mulled wine or whatever you would enjoy on this cold, wintry evening. So please subscribe so that you stay in the know and that you don't miss any of these amazing people who gift me their time and insight every week. (laughs) And thank you for listening. Bye-bye.